thing. I'm going to mute. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the book launch of Care Stories by Christopher Records. Thank you for joining us to celebrate Pride with Christopher Records' first published book and Inlandia's first book of fiction. This is an Inlandia event. Inlandia Institute is a literary nonprofit organization, all for the Inland Empire. My name is Christina Guillen. I'm programs coordinator with Inlandia. And as many of you may know that this event was originally postponed to make space for the protests and memorials that took place across the globe. We'd like to begin with a moment of silence for George Floyd and those who have lost their lives to police brutality. We invite you to join us now. Thank you for joining us. Today we'll be hearing from the director of Inlandia, Katie Porter, as well as in conversation with Christopher Records, the author of today's book launch. And we'll also hear from a representative of UCR's LGBTQ Resource Center, Nancy Jean Tubbs. So a little background on Christopher Records. He's a writer and poet from Riverside, California. His poetry and prose have been published in The Rumpus, Entropy Magazine, Homology Lit, and others. Care Stories is his de debut collection of fiction. You can follow him on Twitter and Instagram at cdrecords001. So please welcome Katie Porter and Christopher Records. Okay, still learning about this Zoom thing and having to unmute myself. So thank you, Christina, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to, going to do a little further introduction. Um, Christopher Records submitted his manuscript um, a couple of years ago now, and it was a, a really long process, and I really appreciate him uh, bearing with us as we went through all the different stages of publication, but we were all very excited about it from the beginning. In fact, um, I know we've had some uh, members from our publications committee who are here today. So hi, uh, Erica, and hi, Judy, in the audience. Um, and we also have another special guest with us today. Um, so I'd like to turn it over to, Christo uh, to Christopher Records to say a few words. And I'd like us to have um, a conversation about the origins of the book and you know, hear a little bit more, um, so maybe some excerpts. And we're going to do a giveaway. So if you stick around toward the end of our um, event today, then you might have a chance to win a copy of this beautiful book, Care Stories. So welcome, Christopher. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you all for attending. And thank you in particular to, to Katie for her patience through this long process and to the Publications Committee and all the people who are involved in Atlantia because um, it's just been a, a, a long uh, process. And I so appreciate the, uh, the dedication and investment of the people at, the, at Inlandia in this book. Um, and I also want to say just thank you to Robert Merrill, who's here also, who edited the book and did such a wonderful job in, in making what is, you know, in people's hands right now, so much better than what I originally submitted. So um, thank you, Robert, uh, as well. Uh, it's, yeah. it's great to be here and, and to, uh, to be able to discuss this, this project, which was uh, so long in coming. <laughs> Yeah, so I brought Robert on because I knew, um, you know, I wear many different hats and as invested in the project as I was, I wasn't able to find the time in my schedule to personally go through and, and line by line um, do some content editing with Chris. So Robert generously volunteered his time. And so I would love, Robert, do you want to talk a little bit about your process and working with Chris? and The process. Well, I had just retired. 
<laughs> and so you hit me up at a great time. So I was looking for new challenges, new ways to keep me busy, um, other than baking cakes and bread, which I've done entirely too much of. And when it came to Chris's writing, I was very intrigued by the concept. And I'm a fan of short stories because I have no attention span. So I like little pieces of things that I can read. Um, but coming out of the classroom, and this being the first thing outside of my education world that I've had to edit, I had to take the teacher hat off. And I'm not editing something that is going to um, make them score better on the SAT or the AP English exam. This is something for fiction consumption. And so you can have an author's style and you can have your own style, but you can't put yours on his. You have to make his better. So Chris has got a very, very distinct style that would drive an English teacher crazy in a regular classroom. They would run out of red ink. But it was really cool to be able to see how he was using language and how he was developing the imagery. And also there were one or two times like, wait a second, didn't that guy have pants on before or not have pants on? I remember we talked about that, pants full, yeah, pantsless. So you have to keep your eye out for those things too. And also little, little things, oh, wait a second, would that guy really go to this restaurant versus that restaurant since he lives downtown? So just trying to keep an eye on these little details and also honor his style, that was my goal. You did a great job. And, you know, I thought living downtown and living in this region for a long time, that really does um, help us to make sure that the details are authentic. Now, Chris, you grew up in Riverside, um, but you've since moved away. And, you know, even though you're in a different county now, I wonder about um, what your relationship was with the Inland Empire, because each of these stories takes place in a different city. There's Harupa Valley, there's Corona, Redlands, Rialto, um, there's Ontario, Temecula. Um, so what was your relationship with the Inland Empire as someone who grew up here and moved away? Well, I, 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 so I, I did grow up in, in Riverside. I spent, um, you know, up until the time I was maybe 22, 22 or 23 living in Riverside. Uh, but my family's been there, you know, uh, my father's side of the family has been in Hemet since I think the 1880s or 1890s. Um, so, I, I mean, it was just always like, in terms of defining what home means, uh, I mean, that's the part of California that I'm from. I think it's also very, I'm interested in the Inland Empire as a place even, I mean, it, 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 without regard to the fact that I, would, that I grew up there, I think the IE is just an interesting place. Um, partly because I think uh, it's sort of unique in Southern California in the fact that uh, working class, middle class people can still live and build lives there uh, to a certain extent. Um, and partly because it's uh, geographically interesting, especially when you're writing about sort of distance and disconnection and loneliness. I mean, the space is an interesting place to talk about these issues. Because when I think about the Inland Empire, I just think about these gigantic spaces between places. Um, and the fact that this, the landscape just goes on and on. So in, um, in writing about you know, loneliness or disconnection or you know, putting people aside, I think it's a, it, it's a good terrain to think about those things. Mm -hmm. So that actually, it's, an, it's a nice segue to some of the themes in your collection, like loneliness. And um, where did the idea for these stories come from? Was there one story that was like the germ of the whole book? or a concept, how did these arise? So I started, the first story that I wrote was Couch Dwellers. Um, and 
I just wanted to sort of play around with some things that had been going through my mind about sort of like this strange thing that you sometimes observe when parents are talking about their children, where they both love them and are disgusted by them <laughs> mm -hmm. or, or treat them with a certain amount of disdain. Um, and I was writing this in 2017 uh, in the specific you know, time period after the election. Um, and just, I, I wanted to spend a little bit of time thinking through our uh, national cultural tendency to sort of want to wish problems away, whether it's a, you know, an errant child who fails to launch or um, you know, a relationship that doesn't go as we want it to or any number of problems. So that's. Yeah. To either escape completely from problems or to put them away, to lock them away. Um, so, yeah. Well, so there's this one really interesting concept throughout that's like another thread besides the Inland Empire cities, but there's this concept of a care center. Um, and you know, there's something appealing about that. It's, it's both creepy and also, you know, I could see where that could actually be a thing, not just for older folks, not like retirement centers, but for people who just um, don't have anywhere else to go or any other life options. Um, what was your vision for this care center that is the thread? Well, I mean, that came out of, of the first story out of Couch mm -hmm. Dwellers, where it was um, just an idea of where would you place uh, children like this? I mean, as where would you sort of throw out people who are inconvenient to your life? Um, and I, I called them care centers because I think I, I, I just was, I, I've been fascinated with the sort of language around um, senior centers and old people and th I mean it's just uh, it, they, these are places I think well I mean it, obviously every situation is difficult especially when you're caring with, for, for elderly parents but um, there's a lot of euphemisms uh, that are used and so I, I, I think that is something a common thread that runs throughout of all of American society where we do these things that are, are sort of morally difficult, right? And, mm -hmm. and we, it, it may be problematic that we're doing them. And then we euphemize what we're doing. Um, so we call things care when in fact it's the lack of care. Uh, we call, you know, solutions, uh, we call solutions solutions when in fact they're just an, a, a continuation of the same problem. I mean, it's just, uh, a convenient way that idea came from. Yeah. So, you know, just you started writing these in 2017, but how long have you been writing? Are there other things that came before this or what got you interested in becoming a writer? I, really, these stories were the first time that I had written in maybe 10 years. Um, mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, that was the reason why I chose short stories, because it was a chance for me to, to sort of experiment and fool around with certain themes mm -hmm. and also certain voices. Um, and there's a sort of nice payoff that you get with the short story if you're if you're writing a short story because uh, it, it can take you two or three weeks to write it and then when you're done you're done and there's the story um so the the fact that there was this instant payoff at the end of it that was good for me as somebody who was just starting to write after many many years of not doing that mm -hmm. um 
and, and since then, I mean, I, I, I feel like I've, I've experiments, experimented with sort of longer forms and, and, and been able to sustain, you know, the same voice over a longer period of time. But um, definitely back then, having just stepped back into it and gotten my feet wet, uh, I think this short story made a good amount of sense. Yeah. Well, one of the stories I think that we focused on when we were first reading this was Tandem. And that one takes place in Riverside and it you know, moves around from some different locations. But um, one of the venues is the Menagerie. And I think I'd like to share, do a quick share screen for those who aren't um, familiar with where this is, but it's a downtown Riverside. It is um, one of the anchor businesses and you know, a lot has happened in the story. It actually, one thing that we haven't talked about yet is that these stories take place in a not so distant future. So they're, you know, a little bit futuristic. Um, and I think there was some talk in the story about it becoming less used over time or more like, um, I think we, it was described as a museum. And, you know, at the time I kept thinking, that's never going to happen. And then um, the pandemic happened <laughs> and here we are. And all of these places, you know, were shut down. And in fact, um, this is what the menagerie looks like right now. It has, you know, been boarded up temporarily and everything downtown with all the protests and it's all covered in beautiful street art and it's just kind of amazing how quickly things can change and you know you do wonder now about the fate of some businesses if they can bounce back after all these extended closures um so th i just thought that was something interesting to share maybe there's a little bit prescient about you know, the way you've written the stories. Um, so I know you've um, you got some selections that maybe you'd like to read a little something for us, for the audience, to give them a taste of your writing style. Sure, sure. Okay. So I'll, I'll do... Um, a reading from Sink, which is one of the stories. Um, and this was one of the later stories I added. Robert was very uh, indulgent of me in this respect. So uh, some of the stories were cut considerably. Some of them I think were removed. And this was one of them that I had written later on. And um, after I submitted the manuscript to Inlandia that got added in. Um, so it, it's called Sink. I'll, 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 it's a fairly short story, so I'll read the whole thing. He liked scaring me, and he was good at it. He did it often. Leaning forward in class, he whispered in my ear, passed me notes, caught me in the bathroom between periods, took the stall next to mine, and spoke through the door, taunt flirting, each interaction mixing menace and something else I didn't know how to deal with and didn't want to name. I've been thinking about you, about what I'd like to do to you. My grandfather taught me that a man is the sum of his fists. He should be able to prove it by using only his fists, but he can also put instruments in the fist and prove it that way too. Phones, hangers, glasses, knives. My parents taught me that men sometimes like to mingle fists and instruments and lips. Nothing that I've learned about men over the last decade. He'd been in the class for about a month when he first showed me his arms by pushing back his black sleeves so that I could see the scars. Not just lines, but also constellations, letters, numbers. Later, he tugged down his collar to show me the pentagram he carved into his shoulder. He traced its white outline with his finger. With my eyes, I traced his lips and his collarbone, the scar and his scratched hands. His hands at work scarring and mutilating his skin. 
I assume that if they were capable of doing that to him, they were capable of doing that to others. We talked a lot those months, in classes, in breaks between, in deserted hallways. He needed an audience. I was eager to listen and watch. He was happy to disclose. I was happy to give nothing and take his words and his looks. Much of it was bullshit designed to shock me. I was a dutiful, closeted, deeply Catholic boy who spent most of my time at school trying to outachieve my peers and trying to walk from class to class without moving my hips too much. I was easy to shock. I was good at perceiving what other people wanted and pretending to be that thing. He told me a lot of things. He told me he was a Satanist and that being a Satanist entailed mastering complicated rituals that he enacted in the park near where we both lived. He told me it involved animal sacrifices and that he liked experimenting with them, like seeing how they reacted to a knife or a lighter before he dispatched them. He usually smiled when he told me these things. I didn't smile, but I wasn't exactly put off. He had pictures of his dog on his social media. It was a Pomeranian. They're Pomeranians. I can picture these things 15 years later. They are vivid. They are vivid because my eyes soaked themselves in him for hours, because I sat with the images behind closed eyelids for hours after school, because I could smell the cream that he used in his long reddish blonde hair, and because I found the same cream a couple years later at a drugstore and used it in my own hair for nearly a decade. He started bringing razors to class a couple months in, showed them to me, said they were what he used on himself. I shuddered. He saw a razor over the skin on the inside of my elbow. The razor grazed it, drew a drop of blood. He looked in my eyes and smiled. I ran into the bathroom and put my arm under the faucet and let the water scald the, pit, the spot pink and clean. He showed me a bound notebook that he filled with words he'd written in his own blood. The blood words were fat and brown and fading. They looked like they were made of tree shit or squashed bugs. I ran my fingers over the ugly, disordered letter, distorted letters and looked at the fine blue veins in his soft hands and was puzzled at the contrast. He had reddish blonde hair and wide green eyes and pink lips and perfect skin. I assumed his blood would dry vivid red. I assumed anything written in it would gleam slightly. I had him over to my parents' house just once. It was around April, about a month before his foster parents sent him off to the center in India. My mother was out shopping. My stepfather was out of town on a business trip. He lived a few blocks away and rode his bike over. We sat in my room talking for a while. He wore black shorts. I could see scars on the back of his calves. I could see the pink on the back of his ankle worn into his skin by his Converse sneakers. His sleeves were rolled up. I examined the shiny scars and the fine blonde hairs on his arms. He sat on the bed with his bare legs against the side of my comforter. He laid back on my pillow and let his hair fall over the pillowcase. He touched the inside of my elbow with the tips of his fingers. I let him touch it. I looked at his fingers and his face and told him that he should probably go. After he was gone, I washed thoroughly the spot that he had cut slash touched. I pulled my shirt sleeve over it. To this day, when I see a needle or a razor or a knife or a pretty goth guy dressed in black, I have an urge to clean it and cover it up. Let's think. Yeah, that is, it's an intense story. And I think that's one characteristic of a lot of your work is it's very intense. Um, and all of these stories seem to capture a different um, facet of queer identity. And I'm just, it's not, all uniform like there it's a whole kaleidoscope prism of different 
um, types of interactions between different types of individuals, but most of it, you know, is romantic in nature or sexual. And, you know, one of the things that struck me, you know, one of the blurbs, blurbers, um, Jason Schneiderman, he wrote uh, that care indexes a new kind of bodily experience, an exhaustion inseparable from desire and a physicality untethered from previous expectations <clears throat> without offering freedom. And, you know, I feel like that does kind of encapsulate this. And I wonder if a book and these kinds of stories could only have existed in this particular time period, if that's maybe a reflection of how we're all feeling, um, at least most of us are feeling uh, in this country, in this uh, political climate. And if you wanted to speak about your um, intentions. Yeah, I mean, so it's a queer book in the sense that the, the, the characters are all queer. But I think that the, the depictions of life are, are, and the, the mood of the book is not, is, is not specifically queer. Um, okay. I think, uh, and I, I, that is also my favorite blurb. <laughs> um, and I, I hope that, that that is actually true, although I, I doubt it, but uh, in terms of indexing a new kind of bodily experience. But I think we're all sort of indexing a new, that new bodily experience. Um, not necessarily in a sexual, but I, I, I just think past five years, past year, past six months, I mean, exhaustion is everywhere. We all have, I think, a sense um, of sort of, well, deep tension. And we see the society around us reflecting that tension, echoing that tension, deepening that tension. Um, and we're fooling ourselves if, if that doesn't, you know, drip down into our own lives, into our relationships with one another, into the way that we, you know, love or uh, hate or relate to one another. I mean, I think there's a sense in, in, in a lot of interactions that I have with people, whether it's family or friends or not friends, of that, uh, of this sort of people carry the tension and grief of these times in their bodies and souls. Uh, it's not, uh, you know, the political reality that we're in or the social reality that we're in. It's not remote from us. It lives in our lives and, and we show it to one another. Um, so I think all of these stories reflect that. All right, I hope they do. No, absolutely, they do. Um, I mean, it, it is a very intense read, and every story is unique. I guess, you know, stepping back to sync for a moment, um, every story has below its title a caption of a city, and I'm wondering where, how it is that that story that you just read to us, how does it relate to the city of Rialto? How did you... Um, what connection is made there? I mean, I don't, so, I don't think that city in particular, in particular sort of stuck out to me as, uh, you know, specifically suited to that story. What I wanted to do in terms of like peg, you know, attaching each story <laughs> um, this kind of like emotional atlas uh, of the region because um, I mean I, I did try with with each of the stories to get at a particular mood or a particular emotional state mm -hmm. and 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 there I hope each one is different from the others in the emotional state that it looks at um, so there's, in this, in the sense that there's an in the physical location of them as well, and have this sort of be 
like a, a landscape, as it were, um, a, a, a snapshot of a particular time and place. Mm -hmm. Well, and they do really feel like that. Um, some of the stories, like Tandem, do feel very anchored to a place. Tandem, you know, also takes place partially at UCR, um, and it goes to other locales um, within the city. But it, it's also told from a, a female perspective. Um, how, and, but it feels very authentic. It's how do you do inhabit each of these characters in order to, um, and I don't know, I guess I, I admire that really about this book is that every character is different. Um, and I just wonder where those characters came from, if you've, if they're at all, um, you know, based on people that you've met or observations that you've made. No, what, what would you say? Well, it, so each of these stories, I, I took maybe two or three weeks. Um, and I would, in jumping from one to the other, take a couple of days break and sort of write down notes of what the character was like. Mm -hmm. um, and those breaks allowed for basically me to, you know, kind of feel out what this person was like. Um, and there were times where it just it wasn't authentic. And so I had to delete all of that uh, and start fresh. Where it was like, this is still in the voice of the previous character. Um, I mean, obviously they're all in my voice in the sense that I'm old and writing them. But um, so I, I actually like that a lot because jumping from one to the other, every, I mean, it's a tabula rasa every time you do it. Um, you have to start fresh and take time sort of feeling them out and, and trying to, to make them, you know, uh, what was the other, what was the other part of your question, Katie? Well, it was just about, you know, writing from these different perspectives, but, um, and I just had another thought. It was... Okay, I'll come back to that when my brain turns back on. Um, it's just, I really loved all these different perspectives and the different um, angles. That's what I was going to ask you. You don't have a formal um, writing background. You, have, you don't have an MFA. Do you have a circle of writer friends that you share work with? Or how have you even learned the craft of writing? Uh, well, I don't know whether I have, <laughs> but um, not really. I, I mean, I, so what I've always done uh, is just read um, mm -hmm. a lot. Uh, and I've been very, very blessed to be turned on to writers who have really influenced me, um, whether it's, you know, Toni Morrison or Raymond Carver or James Salter um, uh, or... Uh, Marilyn Robinson, any number of, I mean, I, I just think the only writing preparation that I've had is just that I've, I've read a great deal or tried to read a great deal. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I, 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 I don't particularly have a circle of, of writer friends. Um, it's just always, uh, I, I think maybe by virtue of the way that I grew up. Um, and maybe this is the case for a lot, well, I was raised by my grandparents. So, oh. uh, I mean, and in a place where there weren't a lot of kids around. So there were a lot of books always. Uh, so the books were, were really what I would do with my summers. Um, mm. And so that was, good, that was good training, I suppose, for, for trying to put something like this together. Well, you know, and that is like the, the number one piece of advice that's given to writers is read. And, you know, you might be surprised that there are a lot of young writers who don't read. 
um, they feel like they're going to become influenced by these other styles and that it might change their voice somehow. But um, in your case, it's like you soaked it all in and now, you know, you've learned, you know, from reading these other writers. Um, but that was something that really struck me about your, when you brought us this manuscript, is that you had not taken a workshop, that you didn't have um, any formal education with writing, and yet something else that you've had occasion to tell me is that since you wrote this, you've written, I don't know, how many other novels? You've been very prolific <laughs> in a short amount of time. Well, um, yeah, is it, so it's been, it's been three or four novels, well, four, since, since this happened. Um, and, and that has just primarily been because the way that I write, the only way that I know how to write is to really just become obsessive with it. Mm -hmm. So I, I generally write something, you know, within three to four months and spend at least four, three or four hours a day on it. Um, with you know seven six or seven hours on weekends um so that uh, and i like the process very much i mean it's it's really it's, for me it is it, it's kind of selfish because it's a chance to be in somebody's head even that even if that person is somebody of my own creation pathetic act you can do really, mm -hmm. <laughs> to try to sort of get in somebody else's head like that. So, yeah. Well, do you want to tell us about some of the other characters from the book? Like, um, who would you be most likely to go have drinks with? Or <laughs> who would you um, be more likely to bring home to meet your grandmother? Or... I mean, are there, did you find yourself really relating to these characters or are there any that you particularly like or any that you particularly loathe? Um, I'm, so I, I, I'll just be upfront and say that my, my favorite of the stories and my favorite uh, of the narrators is the, the narrator, well, is Tandem and the narrator from Tandem. Okay. Um, because I feel like I understand who she is quite, a, quite thoroughly. The emotional dynamics there um, of saying, you know, this person who I've ended up with by chance will do because it's a person. Um, not because of anything that they possess in particular, but just because this, this person is there. Uh, so uh, that that is somebody who I would probably want to go on, uh, uh, you know, go for drinks with. Um, in terms of what were what were the other? Oh, I don't know. Was Maybe, I was just curious about if how you felt about some of the characters. I mean, there are some very different characters from, you know, Elon, who's going finally. Yeah. Or Eon, did I mispronounce it? Um, nope. To the care center the next day and is having this one night of fun but we don't really understand what's driving them to leave everything behind or um crown royal <laughs> or even in in the very first story about um you know the woman in the center who keeps being visited by the tall woman um you know they're they're just, they're all so different. And I just wonder how you feel about them now that you've spent considerable time with each of them. Are there any that you might want to revisit that you think might need their own book? Um, so there are, I mean, there are characters in this book that I wouldn't, that I don't like, like, mm. Like if I, if I were to to be in the world as you know and a regular ba you know as my regular self, I would not want to hang out with them. That said, I I think 
it is, uh, I, whenever I write, I try to inhabit characters who are interesting, not necessarily good. Um, and it's not helpful when you're writing a character to, to make that judgment, whether this person is good or bad. Um, at least it's not for me. I, I really think that in terms of like drawing out a character, it doesn't, it, it, it's immaterial to me whether somebody is good or bad. Um, to understand your motivations, you have to sort of suspend judgment in that way. Um, it's really, yeah, it's really about int interest and getting at their emotional states more than anything else, um, for me at least. So we have a couple of um, comments from the audience. And I'm not sure, Chris, whether you can read them or not. But the first one is, it's not a question, it's just a comment from Judy Cronenfeld, who was on the publications committee and um, who was one of the decision makers. And it says, on a tiny moment in sync, I just loved it was a Pomeranian, <laughs> so understated, but it complicates the character of the Satanist. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think I would like to open it up to some questions from the audience. Um, if anybody would like to say anything, you know, just raise your hand if you know how to do that with the with these controls, and I will let you. I can even let you speak if you'd like to. Anybody? Judy? Hi, Judy. Okay. So, Judy, you should be able to talk now. Whoops, let me un. I, oops. Good. I'm not getting this. Is this this uh, Facebook Live thing? Is that what it is? It, it's been really different. We don't see each other. No, okay. well, this is. Um, we're on Zoom, but but welcome to the party. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I had a question for Chris. Thank you, Chris, first of all, for participating. It's really great to, to hear your, um, your thoughtful answers to some of the questions that Katie asked. And I just wondered, because I'm prim primarily a poet and I've taught people how to write poetry for many years, and um, I've also written in the other genres, but not the novel part, too scary. <laughs> um, and I wondered when, <laughs> how you feel you've learned from the books that you read. And, and the question is very specific. In my own experience with learning how to write, and I am thinking mostly of poetry, I had to do two things. One was to be totally emotionally involved with what I was reading. But at some point I found, and part of my life has been devoted to this, that in order to take that piece of work into myself, that I had to both analyze it and have an emotional reaction to it. In other words, that the emotional reaction alone, and you know, this could be idiosyncratic, <laughs> was not enough, even when I sat down to write and I wasn't following any model, I was just writing, but if I had absorbed the poem, let's say it went through a period of loving 17th century, a poem by George Herbert, and I, it became totally part of me. It had an emotional reaction every time I read it, but I also had an analytical sense of how it was structured. And I didn't write consciously from that analytical sense when I wrote, but things would happen because I understood it in both ways. So I was curious about that because I know this doesn't have to be the case. But did you read and also try to figure out, you know, how did Marilyn Robinson do this? And, or, or just read and, you know, be a genius and just absorb it all? <laughs> I'm curious. No, not at all. Um, and I, so I, uh, right now I'm reading Toni Morrison's Jazz, um, which is beautiful. It's, a, it's lyrically beautiful. And the story is also involving. So, um, I cannot read both for two purposes, really. No, um, no one can, I think. I don't think anybody can do that, where you're like, okay, well, I'm going to absorb the story, I'm going to enjoy the language, and I'm going to figure out how she did all this. At the um, same time. No. <laughs> which is why you go back 
or at least I, I try to, if I like the book, obviously, yeah. if not, then forget it. But if it's a, then multiple readings. I've, I've, I think I've read my, my favorite, if you want to say my favorite book, um, the book that I've reread, I think the most is Light Years by James Salter, um, which is very, it's very interior. Every character is fully drawn out. It's beautiful. It's gorgeously lyrical. I've read that maybe four or five times. Um, and each reading is different in the sense that like, you know, obviously the first was about the language of the story. And then every single successive reading after that has been, uh, how the hell did he do this? How the hell did he draw yeah. all these characters? Um, so I think, yeah, going back and rereading is the only thing that makes sense for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so thank you, by the way, thank you also, Judy, <laughs> you and the rest of the publications committee. I, I'm, yeah. I'm really beholden to all of you. We knew what we liked. Yep. <laughs> so we, um, would anybody else like to ask a question? I know we have one audience question that uh, says, has the book been published and is it available for purchase? And the answer is yes, indeed. Um, it is available through any major bookseller. I mean, you can find it on Barnes and Noble or you can order it uh, through Amazon or you can order it from um, any local bookseller. If, if they don't stock it, ask them to stock it. But um, it is here, it is for sale, it's uh, $16. Um, I have a case of them with me. I am of course, and I don't think I really introduced myself, so for, listeners who don't know. Um, I'm Katie Porter. I'm also um, executive director of Inlandia. And because of the pandemic, we're all working from home. But I have uh, 20 copies in my possession and would be more than happy to um, ship any out. Or if you want a signed copy, then I will work something out with Chris and we can get some um, signed and sent. Um, and there's another question from somebody that, Chris, I, I don't know, are you able to see the questions? Because it says just a comment for Chris, but if you can't read it, it says the goth character reminds me of Aaron from AP US history. So I take it that's um, a personal. Yeah, I said, I, I, I'm assuming <laughs> that this is somebody who knows me. Uh, so we will, we can talk yeah. about this offline. <laughs> <laughs> sure, no problem. Um, so, but that is interesting. You know, I wonder, I think we all draw our, a lot of our material from the world around us. So it's not a surprise when you might see some parallels. Um, and I did, I answered that question, I think. That's everything. Um, would yeah. anybody else? Yeah, yeah Christina? Robert, Robert Merrill. Oh. Chris, yes. I just finished reading A Little Life. Have you read that? I've not. It's on my shelf along with, okay. I've been on a book binge since the, since the lockdown happened and, and well, have not gotten to. <laughs> but yes, it's on my a, shelf. Have a teddy bear to cuddle and a Xanax handy because it's really traumatic. Mm. But I just finished reading it. And when I read it, I kept thinking, this reminds me of your book because of the character's search and need for intimacy. Mm. Because the sex in your book isn't about sex, it's about connection. And I think that's what makes it durable. Yeah. Well, th thank you. Thank you, Robert. Um, I, yeah, and I'll have to check out that book. Very interesting um, observations. And I think that's true of the characters in the book. It's, there's nothing gratuitous about anything in the book. It's all motivated by something um, deep inside the characters, searching for something, for that connection. Um, so, you know, with Chris's book, again, you might want to have a teddy bear and a Xanax or <laughs> your 
um, relaxant of choice, something to, or anxiety reliever of choice. Um, I recommend vodka. Vodka, very and, good. And weed if you want, but um, <laughs> vodka. Very good. Um, so I know you had a couple other um, excerpts that you wanted to share with us, Chris. Would you mind reading some more? Yeah, I can do uh, the last couple pages of the book, um, which is from a story called Great Silence. Um, but yeah. The next week was an infinity, an uneasy, indefinite slog of private thoughts and private misgivings and vague notions that something, something must be done to set this right. I felt pulled to his room throughout the day, pulled to look through the open window to check on him. It seemed to fill the building, to define it, this boy's pain, mistreatment, abuse. This was the place where it happened. It was in the ceiling beams and the fluorescent lights and the drywall and the bones of the staff. We all conspired to make it happen. We all contributed to it. It was our central story. It was who we were. Later in the week, I was assigned meal duty. I loaded up the cart with the box meals and the bags of safety utensils and cups, filled the trays, poured the boys their cups of water, placed the boxes and sporks and napkins and cups neatly on top. I unlocked the slots in the doors, slid the trays in, watched just long enough to see whether the boys started eating, let the evening crew know so that they could pass over or prepare to force feed them. I made my rounds, saving him for last. I picked up the microwaved TV dinner and slid it through. He sat on the ground as he always did, staring off through windows that weren't there in walls that were. The hallway was empty. I unlocked the door and went into the boy's cell. He didn't look up, kept his eyes where they were fixed. I looked at him, the matted hair, the soiled clothes, the bruises on his arms and face. I looked at the room, the hard gray surfaces, the suffocating closeness and darkness, the plastic mat, and the metal toilet in the corner, and the untouched tray of food on the ground. And then I looked back at a plastic bag of cups on the cart, pulled the remaining cups out, placed the empty bag down on the ground, turned left and locked the room. He didn't use it immediately. When they came in to force feed him that night, they found him there, the bag nowhere in evidence. It was sometime in the night when he put it over his head and tied it off around his neck. It must have taken discipline and endurance to get it right, to resist the urge to pull it open and breathe, mindful that there was no second chance, no other bag to use. He must have struggled to keep his arms from tearing at it. Somehow he forced them down, resisted every instinct. He did it in silence, in the gap between bed checks, with steadiness and resolve. I left Redlands maybe a month after that, just long enough after to avoid any undue suspicion. They hadn't reported the plastic bag. Instead, they said he'd suffocated himself with a bed mat, found a way to secretly, slyly cut it up and take the cloth and tie around his neck like a noose. I gave my notice, personal readings, personal reasons. Severance was almost nothing, just enough to make it through the next few months. But it was sufficient for my purposes. John and I sped through the divorce in record time, easily and dramatically, with nothing to divide, with my claims given up. And the only remaining possession, a small account with a few dollars that I'd made by and for myself. He was, after years of poorly concealed disinterest and depression, largely happy to see the back of me, and even happier that I was content to surrender up the house. I'd already discovered Holy Cross, already made my intentions known to the prior through email and by telephone, already made the initial arrangements to relocate to West Park and start the process that had led here, to this vocation, to this house, and this lawn, this afternoon, 
and to the comfortable but false notion that I could make a clean break from what had come before, that I could escape causes and effects, acts and consequences. And now here he was, the boy's long lost father, the end of the line of causation, sweating and twitching in front of me with his gun in my face. He repeated himself, I know you. I nodded. Yes, yes, you do. In the distance, I could hear them, the brothers, those white-robed mimics of the saints. I could hear Brother Jordan's high voice coming down the hill, leading them in the litany. It was Psalm 51. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. His words floated in the air, too pure-sounding to seem human, too angelical too angelic to sound like they might apply to me. Thank you, Chris, for, for sharing with us today from your book. Um, we had one final question from the audience. So um, they say that they're looking forward to reading the book, but also would like to know what other projects we should look forward to from Chris in the future. So what are you working on? Well, so I, uh, I have been trying to get a literary agent for my most recent novel. Um, mm. So that has been a friend of mine. Uh, and I've been trying to write again after a couple months of not. Um, some people have, have I think, at least judging from uh, what they put on Twitter, really taken great creative inspiration from the last couple of months, or at least have produced writing during the quarantine. I'm not one of those people. Uh, for some reason, the, the plague slash depression slash um, multiple other things that we're dealing with have, have not uh, spurred me to be creatively uh, productive. So we'll see if that changes, I, 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 but... Um, the novel, I think, is, is still my, my main priority. Okay. Well, finding an agent can be a challenge, but we wish you luck with that. Um, I know we would like to do a couple of um, book giveaways. So we have some trivia questions that Christina has um, come up with. And so maybe we can, shall we do that, Christina? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Okay. So question number one, the story tandem takes place in a downtown bar called Menagerie. What city does this take place in? So raise your hand if you know the answer and would like, oh, oh okay. We, I saw the first one was um, Naveen Menon. So Congratulations to Naveen. Um, all right, well, we'll do it again. We've got another Can question? I just, uh, yeah. uh -oh. Naveen, hi Naveen. <laughs> <laughs> Naveen was my best friend in high school who I haven't seen in a great, a great number of years. So hello, hi Naveen. <laughs> Here, I can, let's see. Naveen, you're, you're allowed school? to talk. <laughs> Which high school, Chris? Uh, I went to King High School. Okay, in Riverside. So Naveen, if you would like to say something, I've um, permitted you to talk. If that makes me feel very powerful. I can unmute you. Um, but if you don't want to, feel free. It's okay. Um, Did he say the answer of the... He, he raised his hand first. So, oh, actually, that's it. So okay. actually, I guess I should wait and hear what Naveen's answer was to make sure he got the answer right. Um, so Naveen, you raised your hand. Would you like to tell us what city? He's saying his mic is not working. Oh, um, uh oh, type it in the Q&A <laughs> so I know. Um, sorry, I don't know if my mic is working, okay. All right, but I still haven't seen the city from you, Naveen. So, and I know you know, since 
You raised your hand. All right. Nope. Going once. Give it to him. Come on. Give it to Okay. All right. I, I won't be an ogre. Naveen definitely, definitely. Naveen went to Princeton, so he definitely knows. <laughs> <laughs> he definitely knows these things. <laughs> All right. So then let's move on. Next question. Um, sure. So, um, okay. In what city of the Inland Empire could it be too wet for sandals, but too hot for boots? And I'll give some clues. There's also a film festival that takes place every year in the city. Snowbirds oh. there. We've got somebody raising their hand. Okay. What city is it, Stephen? Palm okay. Springs. Palm Springs. Oh. All right. Congratulations. You win. So, Stephen, um, and did we have one more or was that it? One more, yeah. One more. Ask. Okay. The third question. Um, what Inland Empire City contains a mall off of the 10 freeway that is as big as 38 football fields? It takes place in the book um, in a story called From You. Any guesses? Big mall, not too far from here. Um, no guesses. Okay. A story single floor <laughs> that helps it's also in a big circle um it's also become oh robin hi robin oh let's see unmute unmuting okay, okay. it's ontario ontario what's the name what's it called ontario mills you got it all right <laughs> um, so it has changed so much. I remember when Ontario Mills was brand new and we used to take the kids there and walk around um, yeah, and and all the stores. They, they loved going to Rainforest Cafe. I think that's maybe one of the only anchor places that are, and I'm not even sure that's still there. Yeah, it's oh. really gone uptown. <laughs> yeah. I remember it before having a lot of outlet stores and, and things like that when my girls were little and I don't see it that way so much now. No, nope. no, nope. so much has changed. Well, um, you know, we were supposed to have a special guest today from UCR's LGBTQ Resource Center. And I'm afraid something must have happened with her schedule. Um, but Nancy Jean Tubbs, and she wanted us to share a little bit about the center. So I'm just going to make you aware of it. Um, it is, it's Pride Month right now. If you have or know of anybody who needs resources, um, I know you could reach out to uh, the Resource Center at UCR and if you, but if you need other resources besides, um, if you're not say a UCR student or not in Riverside, um, and want to reach out to us, I can direct you to some other resources. LBGT, yeah. Yeah. This is, the website is out.ucr.edu. Um, so with that. And, and if I could just yeah. co-sign that. Um, okay. Because I went to UC Riverside and I, yeah. and I was an undergrad routinely went to the I was looking forward to seeing Nancy who I haven't seen in maybe 10 years but um they do great things and it's it, it's uh unfortunately I, and I never understood why this is but Riverside doesn't have a just a, an LGBT center for Riverside um even though it's a, a major city so mm -hmm. uh the the UCR LGBT center is just is, is really lovely and, and worthy of of your support and uh um, participate in their programs, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely. And I know Nancy Jean, she remembered you, Chris, and we had several different, you know, correspondences leading up to today. So. Well, that's uh, good to know. And hopefully yeah. she had nothing because I was, a, I was, a, I was quite the pain <laughs> in the ass, um, but hopefully they're good impressions. I'm sure they were. I'm sure. So this has been a lot of fun. 
I really appreciate, I'm really excited that your book is out into the world. And, you know, if anybody wants a copy, again, um, you know, you can get it from any major retailer, but you can also, you know, send me a note and I will see about getting you a signed copy. And for our um, giveaway winners today, Naveen, Stephen, and Robin, um, send, I, I will send you an email because you RSVP'd, so I should have your contact info and that way we can connect and I can get a mailing address. Um, looks like we've got, oh, hi Maggie. <laughs> Maggie Hawkins says thank you all. Maggie has also been a very supportive of this book from the very beginning. So happy to have you here. And without further ado, I think, um, Unless anybody has another question, I think we'll all move on with our Saturday. Okay. Well, I'm going to turn it over to Christina and uh, thank you for being here. Okay. Um, thank you to the presenter, our author of the day and to Robert Merrill, Katie Porter for her thoughtful questions and all of our audience. Um, just on a personal note, I really loved the parts of the book that I did get to read so far. And um, it was such a pleasure just to hear more about it from the author. And I, I just really enjoyed it. It was a great um, interview and conversation. So thank you everyone for participating. Um, and uh, let's see, also just a reminder, you can follow Christopher on Twitter and Instagram. Again, that was at CD Records 001. Um, so, okay, thank you everybody. Happy Pride and keep on keeping on. Have a great day. Bye, bye bye everyone bye chris bye robert thank you bye, -bye all thank you okay. congratulations <laughs>